So today we're here to talk about new partnerships to energize growth. You know, in the supply chain world, you're trying to get things from point A to point B, and you've got to do different ways on how you make that done. Well, I participated in a very interesting <laughs> supply chain event. At my church, we have a pumpkin patch. So we get a truck of pumpkins from New Mexico to show up, 53 feet of pumpkins that are hand-loaded. You know how many times it takes to do a pumpkin? So we, you got to have manpower. you got to have a distribution chain, and there's lots of moving parts in this distribution chain. A lot of them are high school kids getting service hours, and so you have to get these kids, and you got to keep them on task, and sometimes a pumpkin goes where it's supposed to, and sometimes a pumpkin goes where it doesn't go. But there's just, it was making new, there was the powerlifting team, there was the beta club, there was all kind of clubs up there doing it, but it was a partnership of different things that made the task of taking these 53 feet of pumpkins and putting them out on these pallets three acres worth. So that's how you energize your new partnerships by going with new people to make things happen. So my name is Chris Tepfer with PrimTech. And if you look in your programs, I have this pretty little ad that says all about my company, so I get to do it visually. Websites tell your story, web applications operate your business, and mobile apps keep you in hand. There you go. So uh, we're going to let our panelists introduce themselves today, and I'm going to start with Bonnie. Hello, my name is Bonnie Kirsch. I'm the Associate Director of Trade Strategy and Operations for Wayfair, uh, the furniture company that doesn't actually own any furniture. Um, so I'm in charge of all um, imports and exports for the US and Canada and um, some of Europe. Uh, so that's what I do. Um, some people earlier said some, some personal things about themselves. So I'll let, um, I know Daryl earlier was speaking about TikTok. Uh, I do have a dog that is famous on TikTok that has um, a million followers. So if any of you are interested in learning more about TikTok, I can tell you a little bit about it not a lot um so that's that's i guess my my fun facts all right hey everybody i'm jared mclaughlin i'm the vice president of branch development and strategy with citizens bank and trust uh, i've been there for three years but the bank has actually been there for 106 years uh I, first and foremost i'm from homa so any cajuns in the room como se va for you for you for you non-cajuns the the response should be ça va bien so uh so we specialize in white glove service, and we define white glove service in, in three ways, three C's of white glove service. One is client experience, and that's kind of like the Chick-fil-A portion. We want to be a, a bigger smile and a better phone greeting. That's, that's just that frontline client experience. But the second piece is equally important, which is uh, consultative banking. We want to actually find out what our customers need so that we can, we can put solutions in place or partnerships in place that help meet their needs. And then the third is compounding the relationship. And that's the magic, that's the special sauce where we do, it's everything that we do that's not banking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But my passion is to ask the question, what else? What else can we do in banking? What else can we do to provide value for our clients? And I don't think enough banks are asking that question, but we, we ask that every day. One of, one of our managers, Peter Henry, has a quote where he says, you, you can't explain what chocolate cake tastes like to someone who's never had chocolate cake. And so banking with citizens is like that. We're that chocolate cake, and if you've never had it, I just, you just got to try it. So uh, personally, my wife, Sandra, and I, we've been married for 18 years, and we have uh, three children. Isla, my oldest, is 12. Um, Amelie, my middle one, is nine. And I, I put a note down here that she's got future CEO written all over her. So if anybody's trying to recruit right now, uh, talk to Amelie. <laughs> And then my little guy, my four-year-old uh, Griffin, and he's, uh, he's awesome. So Nichols State University grad, uh, so go Colonels to anybody who, who's uh, also a Nichols alum. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Aubrey Marino with War Logistics. We're a third-party logistics company headquartered in Buffalo, New York. I run the Houston, Texas operation where we do mostly uh, intermodal drayage, over the road brokerage, and dedicated services. Um, married for 28 years to a man who was kind enough to come all the way over here from Houston to support <laughs> me today and, and hang out man. with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we work really hard in working closely with our customers and our transportation partners to deliver a seamless customer experience. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. Very nice. So we'll get right into our questions. 
The rate of change in the supply chain is impacting businesses daily. What solutions have you found for customers? You had, Aubrey was going to start us off because she had a great story, <laughs> and I don't want to give away the punchline name. So um, I, I know Randy was kind enough to talk about the chassis situation, per diem, and everything that was going on there. Um, container Geddon, who's heard that catch line? Container, uh, container Geddon's real. Um, our customers just aren't big enough to charter their own vessels when they can't find different ways to move their product into the U.S. So our customers really had to start getting very flexible and look at other ports to diversify their strategy. And what we did with them is, you know, they tell us we've got 60 containers on the water coming into Wilmington, so we'd have to hurry quick set up a distribution network, um, partner with our transportation providers, partner with transload facilities, partner with our over-the-road carriers, and just start setting up distribution networks all over the United States. That's what we spent the last three years doing, is just being very agile and trying to get the product move as quickly as possible for the least amount possible for our customers. Y'all feel free to jump in. <laughs> All right. Well, I have an anecdote about uh, how we affected a particular piece of the supply chain. Uh, you know, I think I thought about this uh, supply chain. We talk about a chain. It, that's the aggregate, right? But each individual link is a, is an individual company with its own problems, and you know, each it, their own business model and the own adju adjustments that they have to make. Well, we had. Uh, we had a client that we've been working with for a couple of years, and uh, this particular gentleman owns a, a, uh, a manufacturing slash distributorship uh, business where he, he produces a lot of rigging equipment for the recreational boating uh, industry. And he does, uh, now that we have all this industrial chic kind of architecture where you can get to see the components, he's got some of the most beautiful steel cable I've ever seen. You can make jewelry out of it. Uh, well, about 10 years ago, he discovered that his business model was going to be dying. He saw ahead and realized that being a distributor and a middleman was, was only a, um, you know, was only going to take him so far. And so he converted his business to an e-commerce business. And so he actually went direct to consumer. Uh, he's now made deals with all the big shippers, all the big shipping companies, and he's actually now put his products on Amazon as well. So it's opened up uh, so much for him. He's, he's really got a unique business now. But to make that happen, but here's the, here's the rub. This man is uh, very successful, and yet he's been kicked out of two banks. So you might ask yourself the question, how do you get kicked out of a bank? Well, it sounds like, oh, did he not pay his loan? Did he not? Did he have bad credit? It's it's not that at all. Banking is is got some some ugly sides to it that most consumers don't realize. Is that the banks sometimes, especially larger banks, they just they sort of balance, rebalance their loan book. They look and we don't like we got too much oil and gas uh, you know deals out there. We got too much investor real estate, and then they just start as the loans come up for renewal. They're like, well, we're we're tired of you. We're done. So this person, you know, this is heartbreaking to a business owner that establishes these banking connections. And so, uh, again, this tremendous business person was kicked out of two banks. Well, we stepped in and we provided line of credit financing for him, a pretty sizable line of credit, so that he could take advantage of some raw materials purchases that allowed him to move ahead because he saw the price increases that were going to be coming. And so this has allowed him to, to pivot, and, and we've worked with him. And now we're taking him on a client journey. It's not just transactional. We're not doing one deal. We're now engaged in doing a USDA loan with him. Now, we're a 106-year-old bank. We've never done a USDA loan before. But we're willing to learn for this client because it's what he needs. And now he's going to be building a new manufacturing facility, and it's going to move a lot of his manufacturing domestically so that he can control this and, and be less subject to all these, uh, you know, these international issues with this, the supply chain that we're, we're talking about today. So that's how we partner with somebody to, uh, to help out in the supply chain. Has anyone heard the rumor that Wayfair sells children? <laughs> okay. Um, so I hate to, like, burst your bubble. We don't. 
we don't sell children. Um, so I was recently at our um, warehouse in Canada. It's a, a over a million square foot warehouse, one of many that we have of that size. Um, and there's there's still people joking like, oh, is that where we keep the children? Like, yeah, we just toss them Jolly Ranchers every once in a while and they'll survive. So the reason why um, that rumor came into play is because of anti-dumping. So Randy, I don't know where Randy is from earlier. There you are, Randy. Randy was talking about anti-dumping. He didn't call it that, but that's what he was talking about earlier with um, chassis wheels. Um, and so um, basically what happens, let's say that you are an avocado farmer, all right, in the U.S., and you have a great farm. You can sell your avocados for uh, two bucks a piece, all right? Um, and then some Chinese avocado farmers come in and they dump the market with avocados and they can sell their avocados for a dollar a piece. Now you're like, what the hell? I can't sell my avocados because all of these Chinese avocados have flooded the market. So what happens is the government decides, okay, we're going to put anti-dumping duties on these Chinese avocados. So now they have a 200% duty rate on their avocados. So now they have to sell their avocados for $4 a piece and now the American American farmer can compete again. All right, now pretend your avocados are furniture. That's what happened. All right, so all of our furniture, a lot of furniture, got hit with anti dumping duties. So, what we did, what Wayfair did, instead of deciding we're just going to take those off our website, is said, that's cool, we'll just pass those extra duty rates on to the customer. So, now you've got a dresser that should be, you know, 200 bucks that's now priced for like $1,000 and doesn't make any sense. So, how the American public went from this is a really overpriced dresser to there must be a child in one of the drawers is beyond me, but Wayfair does not sell children. Um, and it's my team that has now corrected that issue and you shouldn't see you know, $10,000 cabinets or whatnot on the site anymore because we've decided that we're just not going to, we're not going to sell those items with the extra duty, right? That's also led to more American manufacturing, which is always a good thing in the end. So that's one way that we've, you know, reduced costs and energized our growth. <laughs> Very nice. All right. So let's look at how do you partner with your customers and potential customers team to maintain a profitable operation? I think I can start with this one, if that's all right. I think um, partnerships are really, really important in supply chain operations. So personally, I'm a licensed customs broker, so I handle all of our imports and exports um, you know, in, in and out of many countries around the world. And as you can imagine, Wayfair imports everything. Um, and so, you know, having partnerships with your customs broker, whoever you're using to do your international operations, is extremely important. The things that customs brokers and other 3PL logistics providers can help you avoid are, are amazing. The amount of cost savings that you can um, save just from understanding rules and regulations, how to get around some of what a lot of people in the industry call Trump tariffs, those tariffs that, that President Trump put into place when he started that trade war. Um, you can avoid a lot of those. So having the right partnership for that is extremely important. Um, also, the government is really going after forced labor right now. Things produced in the Uyghur region of China. Um, there are lots of shipments that are being stopped um, because of that. And if your shipment gets stopped, in the month of August alone, 838 shipments were stopped. One of them was released. The rest of them are in, still in CBP custody and will never be seen again. So if you have the right partnerships with your customs brokers, they can really, really help energize your business and save you lots of money. Partnering with a company like Roar would be a fantastic way to do that. After you've gotten the money that you need to start your business from this guy, then you go over here and you partner with Roar, right? So. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. So what we try to do is we work with our customer and our customer's customers. Because if our customer's customer is always happy, then our customer by default is happy. So by doing that, what we do is we measure everything. I think John said earlier, what gets measured gets managed, and we firmly believe that. So we establish KPIs and we measure it monthly or quarterly to make sure that we're delivering the value that we promised for our customers. Um, Working with your third party or your trucking company, there is so much data that they have that they can help you prepare your meetings for, and that's what we do, is we really sit down and put the data behind it so that our customers understand what they're spending, whether it's 
a cost per mile versus a cost per case or a cost per pound so that we can make sure that they're measuring it um, properly um, so that we're not quibbling over five cents per mile. <laughs> um, but, you know, in any regard, if a customer's customer wants to look at cost savings initiatives, uh, when intermodal was really, really good and we weren't as congested, um, we would look at highway to rail type projects where we would analyze a customer's data and look for cost savings initiatives so that they could move their product from point A to point B at the least amount pro um, possible and maximizing their profits by keeping inventory on wheels. So, Very nice. All right. Well, normally, uh, you know, I feel like I'm at a unique bank because we can actually answer this question. Oftentimes, the banks just provide services sort of passively, but we, we really uh, approach it in several different ways. Number one, we, we partner with our customers by offering the, the basics, the best products and services that they need. But, but number two, we go past that. We do holistic discovery. So, and, and this is something I think sets us apart. We're not limited to just what Citizens offers. Every community bank out there has, a, has an appetite. Every community bank has a, a loan portfolio that's full of the stuff that they're used to doing. What typically happens is if you call a community bank and you ask for some sort of financing or, or access to capital, a solution that, that they don't deal in, the, the phone call goes like this. Do you offer this thing? And it's like, no, sir, we don't. No, ma'am, we don't. Have a nice day. Well, at Citizens, what we try to do is we, we partner beyond that. We try to find the solutions for our customers. So I'm looking over there at, at David at that back table with Evergreen. He, he provides accounts receivables financing. That's not something we have the bandwidth to do. But I'm the type of guy that if I get a customer that needs that as a solution, I want to call David and get him involved in that meeting so that it's not just about citizens, it's about giving the client what they need. So um, b besides that, I think something else that sets us apart is we don't just specialize in banking products and services. I think Chris Tepfer is, is well aware of, of this, that we specialize in introductions. We find out who our clients need to meet. And we, we basically make it happen. We find out who, who, could, who could help put dollars in their pocket, and we make those introductions. We also allow our clients to use, we have really nice real estate. Our, our, our branches are beautiful, by the way. Uh, but we allow our clients to use our conference rooms and our meeting spaces to, to set up events uh, that we, um, we, we buy the breakfast, we buy the, you know, we, we provide resources so that they can shine to their clients or to their prospects so they can land more business. But we really want to focus on, we, we have cash flow conversations with our, with our customers. What, what is the product or service that you sell? How do you get paid? What expenses do you have to, to, uh, to pay for to run your business and how do you pay for them? And basically we help, we help business owners uh, collect fast and pay slow. And I think that's something that all business owners want to try to do. And if we can buy time for people, then that's, that's what we do. Lines of credit are a great way to do that. So we have a number of tools in our tool set. Anybody have a, a situation that they have a question about that where they're having a profit issue because there's been so many changes that they want to ask at this time? We're kind of on a roll with that. Bueller? <laughs> okay. Put that down as no. <clears throat> All right. We'll move on to, are there any special programs that could be used to tackle supply chain difficulties? I'll go with that one. Uh, so again, this is a, a new space for us because we're trying to answer the call to, to what's going on. The, the, the world has issued some challenges and we want to step up and be part of the solution. So, you know, access to capital is so important. Uh, the government is really good at making messes, right? I mean, they, they make mistakes and uh, they put us in a bad situation. And occasionally they can, in a reactive way, be somewhat part of the solution. So the government, to, to tackle supply chain issues, has issued an, a number of programs. They beefed up their USDA lending program. It's not just agriculture, by the way. The USDA, uh, it, it has... Um, special special programs for uh, food processing uh, facilities, as, and uh, as well as other things that you would never. I actually saw one a deal recently where it was a it was a bowling alley. I'm not sure how it fits for USDA, but it somehow <laughs> fits. It somehow fits in there. Uh, but these are government guaranteed programs. So what what it allows the bank to do is to take chances on some of these things, knowing that you know 80 percent up to 90 percent. Uh, SBA right now, 90% is uh, covered for export lending. So how do you become an exporter? So that's obviously what the government's trying to encourage. They want small businesses to be exporters. Well, the, the basic way is to have an intent to export. So it's, it's things, simple things like that. Um, 
that we, that we as bankers can learn for our clients so that we can offer these programs. And not all banks do. These are things that there's a, they're paperwork heavy, they're, they're guideline heavy, but if we get good at these things, we can offer these solutions for our clients. LED, uh, Louisiana Economic Development, they have programs, special lending programs that give bonuses or, or extra uh, guarantees for if you hire so many workers. So there's all sorts of different programs out there. And sometimes the, the, the business owner needs to actually tweak their business model to fit the, the financing so that they can get access to capital so they can continue to grow and surge. So I think that that's, you know, there are special programs out there, and, but if banks don't carry them, then they're not available. They, they, you, can't just, you can't go borrow money from the SBA. You have to go to an SBA lender that carries that program. So in our, our conversations, uh, I think that both Aubrey and Bonnie are special programs in their respective <laughs> business where they're getting these products moved around. Is there anything you've seen in the last couple of years, either of y'all, that have, that have changed where you've, you're doing more of X than you used to do Y to make product move? How much time do we have? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 23 minutes. <laughs> um, for us personally, I mean, our team has worked really hard um, over the last few years since COVID hit. Um, the rules of engagement have completely changed. Um, a lot of you in this room that move freight um, in or out of our ports um, have seen it. Randy discussed the per diem issue. Um, some things like demurrage, um, trying to get things out of the port so that you can get a container empty for your exports. That could take a month sometimes. Um, if we need to clear demurrage, sometimes there's these transmission delays and you know our customers have to account for that. Um, we can touch the same load for two to three months before it even gets delivered to the customer, which is it's hard. It's, we've had to double our workforce. We've had to do a lot more tracking and tracing. Um, we've had to get innovative as far as how we work with the ports and the steamship lines to gather information so that we can be more successful for not just our customers, but for our carriers, because our carriers are flying blind every day. Um, they've got a driver at the port and all of a sudden, you know, the steamship lines advance the cargo cut to noon that was supposed to be there at five and they get there at 1201 and it's, I'm sorry. And that creates its own set of difficulties. So, so yeah, it's, it's been a um, very interesting few years. And I think, you know, our team has done a really good job as far as evolving with the change. But it's definitely a lot more work. Yeah, I think on the import side especially, a lot has changed. Um, when President Trump was in office, whether you like him or not, that's irrelevant. Um, the things that he did related to trade were <laughs> a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of stuff. I mean, he started a trade war with China. You have extra duties on steel and aluminum that I know some of you have mentioned, you know, alluded to earlier on the panels. Um, he renegotiated NAFTA. Now we have USMCA. Um, but there are a lot of free trade agreements around the world. People have heard of NAFTA. They've heard of USMCA. And those are ways that you can get your goods in duty-free, but there are free trade agreements with lots of other countries like Chile and Jordan and Australia and Singapore, and I could list lots of them that no one's ever heard of. Um, so again, this is why having those good partnerships um, with your freight forwarders and your customs brokers can really help you take advantage. Uh, there are a lot of duty mitigation strategies out there that you can employ. Um, and on the export side, if you're someone that's, that's looking to begin exporting, um, I highly recommend you reach out to a good freight forwarder who can make sure that your your goods aren't subject to any export licenses um, and also you know keep in mind what's going on in the world like Russia and Ukraine right that situation right now is, is pretty tense and it definitely affects where you can export to and where you can import from so you know just knowing what's going on in the world being aware of that and how it affects your supply chain is really important what I'd hate for you to do is ship something somewhere and then it gets stuck forever because you're just not able to do that in the first place and now you've lost a whole container load of product so again just having those great partnerships those great discussions ahead of time is really important what are the common education issues that most of your customers are not aware of well for us um, we have a lot of customers that move to um, 4pls which is great 
Um, 4PLs allow you uh, visibility platforms to your product and it lets you measure what is happening in the market and they have the cascading tier tendering so that you're making sure that your product is actually being tendered to the carrier that you promised in the procurement event. Um, really what I would like for our customers to better understand is it's not a set it and forget it type of operation. Um, it's happening, the visibility platform is great, but question the data. Um, make sure you're working with your transportation partners because that's what your transportation partners are really there for. Make sure that all of the measurements are correct. Work in tandem with your transportation partners, not just the 4PL, to make sure that everything is working the way it should and there aren't any better um, values, value adds that your carriers could provide for you. Um, like Randy said earlier, carriers change lanes all the time. They're going with the drivers. So even though they did a procurement event um, one day, their whole business model could change the next just based on what we're talking about here today is changing distribution models. So it's really important that you have those open conversations with all of your providers regularly so you can make sure that they're moving in the right origin destination pairs or see if you need to do a better um, replacement at it. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> did, did I talk too long? No, no, no. You did great. <laughs> what common education issues that most of your customers not aware of? I mean, most of the people I deal with have n no idea what's going on in um, imports and exports, which is great for me. It's job security. But um, that's, that's part of my role, right, at Wayfair and wherever I happen to work is to let everybody know what's going on and what they can take advantage of and, you know, to tell people, like, no, don't let our supplier do that or, you know, don't charge anti-dumping to the, the customer because apparently it creates a PR nightmare. Like, it's, it's my job to... To, you know to educate everyone um, within the company and outside of the company because as you can imagine we have a ton of suppliers that we're working with as well um, another partnership I want to mention though is that um, somebody said something earlier about automated trucking and how they didn't think it would really happen soon uh, wafers already doing it <laughs> we're using automated trucks between um, Houston and Dallas right now um, we've partnered with JB hunt on that um, and so that's a fantastic you know we're always at the forefront of innovation and technology. So that's that's a really cool partnership. Um, Google it. You can find a lot more information about it if you're interested in that. So, so we talk about uh, partnerships and getting somebody new, and, and we're coming here to a networking event. And I was talking to Dwayne at my table earlier, and he said he met Henry Beard from looking him up on LinkedIn. And so then they built this relationship, and, and they're both here today attending this event. And so you know, you're finding these partnerships. So I do a lot of stuff with Jared. I'm just an old salesman. I did industrial sales. I did commercial, residential, the whole nine yards. But I found a bank that wants to do things that are different. And it's, it's going at things from a more holistic, what can we do together to serve people? You know, there, there's a group, Givers Gain is a motto of BNI, the group that some of us belong to. And these are the changes in the world that are going on where we have to go find new and different ways to do things. And so maybe y'all have, who's somebody you're doing business with that you weren't doing business, say, pre-COVID? So uh, we're doing business with a lot of different transportation providers, um, but what we really work hard to do is that connection, right? So as our products are being moved to different ports, we're making connections at the port level because if there's problems, um, clearing product at the port or getting product moved in or out, or if we need to find different transportation partners, we are really working hard with the people that do the economic development at the ports. They are a great resource and they're there to support all of our customers with products coming in. Um, so we work really tightly with them. We work really tightly with the carrier community and we're building transportation partners with new warehouses um, using um, the sources that we have available to us thanks to some of the IWLA sponsorship here today. I else want to take a crack at that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what customer outcome delivers the most job satisfaction for you? 
Wayfair is, is pretty well known for our customer service. That's one of the things that I think sets us apart, um, you know, in the industry. Um, but what people don't see behind the scenes is the the crazy supply chain, um, you know, network that, that goes into that. So the way that it works is, you know, our suppliers import into the U.S. and they store it at one of our warehouses. But Wayfair doesn't actually own any of the furniture until a customer places the order. So once a customer places an order, we then buy it from the supplier at our warehouse and deliver it to your door. So we only own it for that very last piece, right? That final mile delivery. But um, in doing so, we have a fleet of chassis that we own. Um, we have all kinds of, for our large parcel items like furniture, like larger furniture, hot tubs, gazebos, those sorts of things. We do have Wayfair owned trucks. Um, so we have a crazy supply chain network, you know, behind the scenes. We actually have our own freight forwarding and customs brokerage company called Castlegate Forwarding that is part of Wayfair. And that's something that other companies in our space are doing as well. So Amazon has their own. Target is starting up their own. So I think it's a really interesting time to see, you know, companies like Wayfair that are really just e-commerce platforms, um, you know, getting into the supply chain space because, frankly, it's a mess, right? We all know that, like you were talking about, right, we have containers just sitting at the ports waiting to be delivered. A huge strike at um, the ports <laughs> lately um, on the West. West Coast um, that we're really holding everything up. So it's really interesting to me to see these companies who typically, you know, aren't supply chain companies are forming their own supply chain companies in an effort to, to tackle these issues that everybody's seeing. So I think that's definitely a unique thing that's kind of come about since COVID and, you know, just with all of the issues going on. So what outcome do I like, ultimate outcome do I like for my clients? Uh, well, first of all, I look out there and I see some faces. Uh, Roland Godet's getting up and leaving the room, but he's our main office branch manager. I've got Mary <laughs> Pusho, our Perkins Row branch manager, and Latasha Curry, our Bocage branch manager. And the, the feedback that I get daily from the job they do is just tremendous. We, we I mean, Latasha's put tears in people's eyes. To say, there was somebody that said, uh, I didn't know a bank could care so much. There's somebody recently said, I didn't know I could have so much fun going to the bank. So that's the basic thing I want for my clients, that type of satisfaction. But it goes deeper than that. Uh, I, I also want my clients to be underwritable. So if they come to us, often business owners are so busy, they get their, you know, they're in the weeds, they're, they're running their business, and they're forgetting to maybe document everything and keep very good track of everything. And so, you know, I encourage business owners to work with folks like John Roberts, and don't walk out, John, <laughs> I'm giving you some kudos, uh, so that they can stay organized. And because if you come to the bank, I mean, you can tell your story, but if you don't have the documentation that matches your story, then you know we can believe in your story, but we can't do anything. But because we are regulated, and we do have examiners look at our loans and make sure that we're being fair in in the way we apply, you know, our, our credit policy. So that's. But then I think the ultimate outcome is, you know, uh, I feel like our business model allows us to take the burden of banking off of our clients, so that we we take we don't even have an 800 number that you can call and get stuck, oh, you're, you're talking to the wrong department, you gotta get transferred to this one, get transferred to that one. We don't even have that as a possibility. You call us with your situation and then you can hang up the phone and then they'll get back with you once they fix it. So for me, why, that, why is that important? Because 39% of small business owners work more than 60 hours a week. 43% of small business owners don't take a vacation and that's heartbreaking to me because I feel like they're, they're spinning their wheels maybe dealing with some stuff that's not revenue producing for them. So we want to take that burden off of them and save them some time so that they can enjoy more time with their family, have a better life work balance, and also make more money. So that's the outcome I like to see is business owners thriving and hitting that next level and making their dreams come true. So on a moderator level, the outcome that I would like to see is I want to form some partnerships with people in this room that want to re-energize new partnerships and tell me some stories or ask some questions, that's all it takes, of things that you're seeing out there to share with the room, things that, that you're doing business in a different way than you were before. Okay, another Ferris Bueller moment? Yeah. But anyway, so, you know, using what used to be uh, competitors as a resource and an outlet for advanced growth, right? So. 
you know, for years past, businesses would always keep their information close to the vest because I, we're all competing for the same work. Well, now there's more work than we can actually do. So have you found success in aligning yourself with a former competitor to be able to offer the services to the customers that, that they demand? In my experience, we have. So uh, I'm just wondering if it's... For me personally, um, we're a third-party logistics company, so we do not own any assets or equipment. So in our world, we are the selling arm for our transportation partners and for the uh, railroads. So, you know, in essence, we're competing with each other every day on the same book of business. Um, so that's just kind of always been my world. So yes, um, we're always working with our transportation providers just to understand, you know, hey, I can't help this person. Um, this is what they need. It's beyond my scope. And if you could work with them, make those introductions and make sure that we're making sure that the customer is taken care of. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're in business to do is, is to take care of our customers. So you're talking about competitors. The uh, the guy that does my job at Amazon and I are friends, and we we go to the government regularly and speak together on behalf of you know our two companies um, about legislation that we want to have changed. Uh, we're going to Canada in a couple of weeks to talk to them about some upcoming legislation that they're trying to pass. Um, so yeah, I think working closely with your competitors in some cases where there's a joint, especially when it comes to legislation, if there's a joint effort there that you can combine together and let both of your voices be heard, I think that's fantastic. And if you're not as big as Wayfair or Amazon, joining those organizations that can lobby for you on your behalf, I think is, is really important. So Beryl, my first uh, response, my initial gut response was, well, we don't have any competitors. There's only one Citizens Bank and Trust. There's only <laughs> one doing what we're trying to do. But then I, I, I slowed down and I said, okay, we actually do a pretty good job. We, we're members of the LBA. We're members of uh, ICBA, which is uh, Independent uh, Community Bankers of America, LBA's uh, Louisiana Bankers Association. And we, we do play well with, with our, our other partner banks. Uh, every, every bank has a legal lending limit. Uh, basically, it's the amount, the max amount of dollars that we can you know, issue to one particular client. Uh, so when we have a need that's bigger than that, we sometimes do what's called participation. So we'll reach out. We have some, some sister banks that we'll reach out to and actually uh, do bigger deals than what we could do by ourselves. So I think the answer is, yeah, we, we do partner and, uh, with competitors. So, Bonnie, I've got a question, and, and Aubrey, you can certainly chime in. You, you know, we and I, you and I both have some anti-dumping, you know, background here. We've been exposed to other companies in other regions of the world, right? That's going under the banner that they would not be under penalties, tariffs, but then really, as we vet them out, they're lying, right? And that seems to be a time-consuming process. At Wayfair, have y'all figured out how to streamline that process so that way you can spit out the, the bad players faster? I, do you mean like it's a time-consuming process to get a company to have levied, to have anti-dumping duties levied against them? No, 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 as far as in approved country, let, let's say Vietnam. Okay. Right? So Vietnam's a good place to come in at, but yet they're really truly selling Chinese stuff through Vietnam or Mexico, pulling in Chinese stuff into Mexico and then selling it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we vet them out, and, mm -hmm. and it's a time-consuming process, right? And you with furniture, you've got to have that problem all the time. Mm -hmm. Have y'all streamlined your process, and what did you do? I mean, ultimately, trans shipping is illegal. Um, if you have something coming from China and someone says, no, it's not really coming from China, it's coming from Indonesia, like that's BS, we know better. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the importer of record who's responsible for getting that right. Um, so if, again, it goes back to Inco terms. <laughs> you need to know your Inco terms and your selling terms. And if you are acting as the importer of record, you have the liability to get that right. If you are not trusting your supplier that they're being honest, I would not act as the importer of record in that case. I just flat out wouldn't do it. I would refuse to because then the liability is no longer on me. It's on your supplier or your vendor to get it right. Um, but you're right. It is a frustrating and time-consuming process. So... Anybody else? 
Going once, going twice. Okay. So y'all want to kind of give some closing remarks of what uh, new partnerships and energizing those means to you? I mean, ultimately, I think, um, you know, forming partnerships with everyone is important, right? I mean, we're networking here today um, and we're all forming partnerships with each other. Um, I would encourage all of you, try to leave the room today with several names of people um, that you know that you can reach out to after this event ends. Like you may remember, oh, you know, I remember the gentleman that was sitting at my table as a forklift expert. If I ever need a forklift, I know who to call, right? Somebody else was in real estate. If I ever need real estate, I know who to call, right? So, so leave the room with that. I think partnership Partnerships in general are, are very important. At the end of the day, even if you're working with you know a, a competitor, um, you can still reach out for best practices. You know, I had this problem. How did you solve it? We should all help each other and work together. So forming partnerships not only with other companies but with just the people in this room uh, is very important. No, I would ditto that. Um, connections are very important. I go back 10 years and look at different connections. Um, we might not have spoken in a long time, but it's like, hey, I know somebody that can help you. Um, that's what we're in the business to do, all of us, is to make sure that we're helping each other um, and network together. I met a young lady earlier. Um, I have no idea what she does, but you know what? I had a kid that worked for me that does exactly what she does, and he could be her next new rock star. I don't know whether it's talking about, you know, people that are best matched for other companies or services that are matched for other companies. Um, we're all making connections every single day. So definitely work with your competitors, work with people outside of your comfort zone, and definitely reach beyond um, your uncomfortable zone. So my question for everyone is, do you, if you think about your current banking relationship, does it feel like a partnership? Or do you think of your bank as a business partner? Because if the answer is no, then, I would, then maybe you don't know that that's possible, but I would encourage you to think of your, your banking uh, relationship in terms of a partnership. And you need to be with a bank that wants to go on that client journey with you, that wants to look at your business model, that wants to look at what your plans are, your, 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 your one year, your three year, your five year plans, and kind of work with you to make those, those things fulfilled. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people do. You know, most people choose a bank based on who their, their, their mom and dad banked with. Or the other one, the other big one is who, where they went to college. If they went to college and their, their mom and dad's bank wasn't there, then they choose a bank in college. But you know, we're all grown ups here. It's time to like pick one deliberately and, and, and pick a bank that matches your needs and helps your business get where it needs to be. Networking is such a great way to re energize your growth through partnerships. <clears throat> Everybody is here because they network with somebody else in this room. And people that come to events like this are people that are looking to energize the business community to build the market. A rising boat lifts all, a, lot, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's what we should take away from this. So we would encourage y'all to go out and, and meet the people in the room. Let's do business with one another. That's really why we're here at the end of the day. And we're trying to move our businesses forward to be more profitable and more enjoyable place to work. Thank y'all very much.